pagan Frankish king Clovis uh, first heard of the crucifixion of Christ, uh, he was distraught and he cried out in a loud voice, if only my, I and my troops had been there. Uh, he, he thinks he would have rescued Christ, but he was, last week we talked about not missing the plot. He kind of missed the plot, didn't he? He was missing the point. Uh, Christ was born to die, uh, to come and uh, take our sins upon himself to be a substitute. He took the punishment that should have been on us, he took it on himself. Why? Well, because he loves you, because he loves us. And he was creating a way for us to have salvation, peace with God, a way back to relationship. J. Vernon McGee put it this way, uh, talking about the Gospel of Mark and <coughs> how it's culminating this crucifixion of Christ. Mark is the Gospel of action, and this 15th chapter sets forth the supreme nature of the action. Everything's been building to this point. It is the crucifixion towards which all creation and the purposes of God were moving from all eternity. For he was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. The gospel, <coughs> or excuse me, the gospel is now translated into action. Paul could say later on, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. And then McGee continues, You see, the gospel is what he did, is not what God is asking you to do. It is his action, not your action or mine. You and I are in no position to do anything that would be acceptable to God. Your righteousness and my righteousness are not acceptable for salvation. God must and does provide that righteousness in Christ. He, Romans 4.25, was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, for our righteousness. Did you catch that? Why, why did Christ come to earth to rescue sinners? Why did this dear Lamb of God, why has he, his whole life been moving towards the cross? Why does the king of kings, who has all power, allow himself to be uh, badly mistreated by wicked people, uh, spit upon, uh, mocked, beaten savagely, and finally hammered to a cross? He didn't have to do these things. <coughs> the cross does away <clears throat> once and for all the fairy tale of human goodness. If we could uh, be acceptable to God on our own merit, there would be no cross. If we could earn salvation, we could earn heaven by our own works, there would be no cross. Jesus went to the cross because you and I can't cut it. And this symbol that we wear around our necks and it's jewelry and it's cute is a symbol. You have often heard me say it's like a neon flashing light in history. You can't cut it. God loves you. The cross is there because we don't measure up. God knows. And God loves you. So when we come to church, it's no use putting on a hypocritical, self-righteous play act you know, God knows better than that, right? We come to church in love with Jesus. We come to church wanting to know him better. We come to church uh, striving for his path because it's high, uh, higher than our path. His ways are better than our ways. Uh, goodness is better than wickedness, all these things. And we come to church united by the understanding that the only reason we can be here, the only reason we can call ourselves Christians is because the blood of our Savior poured out for the forgiveness of sins, as we saw last week. Brothers and sisters, we're not here to pretend. 
We're here to get real with God. Real God can forgive my real sin. And I don't need to play act and pretend. I am so grateful and thankful for a God that sees me as I am and says, I love you. Come into my family and now get busy. I want you to go out and help me bring more people into the family. God loves us so much. So Clovis, King Clovis, he heard about a good man, an innocent man, being hammered to a cross by the Romans, and uh, he was distraught. But he missed the point. That king didn't need saving by some Frankish king. The Franks were like the forerunners of the Germans and the, and the French. Uh, he didn't need saving by this Frankish pagan King Clovis. King Clovis needed to bend his knee before the king of kings who loved him enough to die for him. And incidentally, Clovis uh, later uh, humbles himself to the gospel and gets baptized and uh, becomes, a, becomes a Christian king. We are hopelessly lost without him. And remember the, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount in, in uh, that portion of the Beatitudes. And we're, we were talking about how that was the first major sermon of Christ recorded in Scripture. So who is Christ? Well, he's God incarnate. So what we have here is God waiting throughout history, waiting for this time. He said it more clearly than any of the Old Testament prophets. God waiting to come in person to tell us this. And, and the first things he tells us is blessed, which remember, blessed means happy or even lucky is a way to translate the word lucky, is the person who understands they're spiritually bankrupt. That's what poor in spirit means. Blessed are the poor in spirit. God comes down and says, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be happy if you understand that you are spiritually bankrupt, and that's why you need me. God coming down to tell us this. We are utterly lost without him. The cross is such a big deal. This week I've been thinking about songs like The Old Rugged Cross. Uh, I, I told you this before, but uh, when we were in Japan, we were working with another pastor, and his name was Wesley Calvary, which is a Wesley Calvary is a great name. And uh, he took us out to eat once, and I told him, I guess it is true. Calvary covers it all. Uh, the cross of Jesus Christ covers all of our sins. And it's pride, it's hubris to think, oh, I have sinned so big that the blood of God himself could not cover. What arrogance. Grab a hold of this hand of salvation, the nail-pierced hands of salvation. His work on the cross is more than adequate to deal with anything you and I have ever said, thought, or done, any sin nature within us. The cross is sufficient. Jesus Christ said he is sufficient. And yet we go through our lives looking and striving and feeling guilty and thinking we need more of this and more of that. But Jesus is right before us saying, I am sufficient. And every once in a while I say, oh yeah, you are, my, you are my sufficiency. You are everything to me. Utterly lost without Christ, utterly safe and secure with Christ. Do you believe it, brothers and sisters? Amen. God is good, and he's quick to forgive. And we, our job, in order to live a life in step with the Holy Spirit, is to keep coming back and getting honest with God, saying, my attitude is sinful. What I've done, God, was wrong. Help me to do right. I want to do it your way, not my way. And thank you that you've already forgiven me on the cross. Anyone who is not convinced of their sinfulness, one, they just are totally in the dark about themselves. Anyone who is not convinced of their own sinfulness also has probably never tried to be good. I mean, they did things that they were happy to see other people could see, and ah, I'm good, I'm basically good. But when you try to deny your flesh, you will understand how corrupt you are. When you've got that zinger you want to say, and you're not going to say it, when, you, when you're struggling with bitterness and forgiveness, and you say, no, 
is not what God has for me. When you struggle against uh, lust and greed and temptation of all sorts and this desire to, to, to have the spotlight and this, this, uh, this feeling where we, get, we feel snubbed and we, we want to sit and pout because somebody hasn't treated us the way we think. When you try to do good, you will learn the full weight of temptation. Uh, if we continually just follow our heart, give in to what we feel, you're never going to feel the struggle. So in this sense, think about this. Christ felt the weight of temptation more than anyone because he never gave in to sin. When you give in to sin, you never feel the power of temptation because you're just capitulating, rolling over like a dog. I give up. Christ knew the power of sin, and yet he never sinned. Anyone who isn't convinced of their own sinfulness probably never tried to be good, really totally in the dark as far as their own nature, and has never been around two- and three-year-old kids. Uh, society doesn't teach them that. They're born with that. You've got to teach them to tell the truth. They come out being able to manipulate and lie pretty. They got that one down. I haven't seen any parents try to teach their kids how to be dishonest. we all got to struggle to create them honest. That whole sharing thing, Never seen a parent thought, oh, my child shares so incredibly well, I need to teach him to be selfish. Some child, children share well, better than others, you know, all different types. But I've never seen a parent have to teach their child to be selfish. Uh, we want to teach our kids to share. How about not pouting and stomping your foot when you don't get your way? There are things that come natural to us because we're naturally sinful. And Christ wasn't like that. Christ was tempted in ways that you and I aren't. Because honestly, you're not tempted with every kind of sin out there, right? I'm not. Some things that other people struggle with, I don't. Got plenty of my own struggles. But there are sins that I just don't struggle with. Uh, Christ struggled with every temptation, every sin. And yet, without sin, everything came against him. And he never sinned in thought or in deed, even once. This was the... This was the Holy One, the spotless lamb. That's in the Old Testament why they couldn't have a crippled lamb or a diseased lamb or a lamb with a blemish. It was a symbol of the lamb of God that was coming that would be perfect and without sin. And just like in the Old Testament, you took that lamb and you applied it to the, to the doorpost, the, the blood, lamb's blood, so the wrath of God would pass over. When we apply the, the blood of the spotless lamb of God to our hearts, the wrath of God no longer resides on us. It will pass over. This is love. This is not what we deserve. The, the, the stupidest thing, can you say that in church, that I've ever heard people say is, I just want God to give me what I deserve. And I, I want to like take 10 steps away, you know, or, or maybe 100 feet, you know. <laughs> I am never going to stand before God and say, give me what I deserve. I know I can be an ordinary, difficult person, and I know that heaven has not looked down and said, oh, Dan, stamp of approval on that attitude. No. I'm thanking God for mercy because I'm getting what I don't deserve. I'm totally forgiven. I'm totally loved. And eternal life is mine. The, heaven, the gates of heaven are wide open. And he, get, he allows me to, to share in this mission, to share his love to everyone, to bring forgiveness and grace and mercy. And you say, well, that person doesn't deserve it. Well, that's the first part of getting it. The second part of getting it is, and neither do I. Therefore, I am going to find a way to love this person whether they, I think they deserve it or not. Christ, totally different. Today's, the title of today's sermon is, When God Died. If anyone has ever died like a God, it was Jesus Christ. Remember, one of the things we've been talking about is this book. Uh, you've got to deal with this book. You've got to deal with the history of Christianity itself. Uh, when humans make religion, what do we do? We aggrandize ourselves. We find a way to make ourselves acceptable to the gods or, or something, some of our accomplishment can win us out of this, uh, this circle of destruction or whatnot. It, it depends upon us. And, and uh, even when we talk about grace and peace from the gods, we're somehow earning it, being good enough to deserve it. Christianity is the strictest of all religions. People think, oh, other religions are so strict. Christianity is sweet. No, strict, Christianity, 
Strictianity, that's a good name for it. Christianity said, you are so utterly, desperately lost, the death of God himself is the only thing that could avail. You are so desperately wicked, the only thing that could save you is the death of God incarnate. You are lost. Nothing you can do can earn salvation. And then Christianity has the greatest grace because it turns around and says, accept this free gift from God and he will forgive and he will bring you into his family. Nothing you could do could ever earn his love. He'll give it to you for free. And so we have this a situation where when humans make religion, we make our culture so great. And when we look uh, at the Christianity today, because of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and other things, there's no culture that can claim Christianity. It's not a Western religion. In fact, some of the most exciting things in Christianity are going on in places like Nagaland, right? Uh, Korea, China, uh, the Third World. Uh, this religion does not belong to the West. It never did. Uh, Christianity does not belong to one language, one people group. It's not here to aggrandize ourselves. Christianity was never meant so that we could sit on some big throne, some, some hill, and look down at some sinners below us. You get to Jesus on your knees, and we're in relationship with Jesus on our knees. This religion is not made so that we could be holier than thou, uh, enjoying being critical and self-righteous and patting each other on our backs because we're not like those people. Uh, and then we even saw last week in chapter 14, we saw Peter, the great apostle, deny Christ three times. Remember that? Well, how did that story get written down? That's the way it was. And remember, we've often said that Mark might have been the uh, scribe for Peter. Uh, the early church even called Mark the memoirs of Peter. Peter is the one who probably shared, I said, I would never leave you, Christ. I would never, and I denied him three times. This book is not here so that the apostles look great. Never was. This book is because Jesus Christ looks great. He's the only uh, sinless, perfect person we see throughout the scriptures. Religion, when we make it, it's so our culture, our people, ourselves can get rich get, get uh, positions of authority, look good. And this book was never like that from the beginning. And I want to tell you something. Uh, when some scholar on television comes on TV and said, uh, other religions have dying gods. Uh, there's gods who die and their blood is sprinkled over the grass so that you can have new seasons in the spring. And it's just the same as Christianity. No, it's not. <laughs> and you know better. Uh, you know better. If ever there was a God who died, it was Jesus. And as we read this chapter, you'll see there's nothing like it in mythology. It's, 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 it's actually a greater myth. It's a joke that people would actually compare what happens, what we see in Scripture, uh, to the different mythologies. Uh, let's look at Mark chapter 15. Very early in the morning, and we don't know exactly when, it could be first light, which may have been around 6.30, or could have been first light around 4.30 or dawn at around uh, 5.30 or 6.30. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. Uh, what's interesting here is that they had a trial during the night, but that trial was illegal. Uh, and so they had to have another trial uh, they weren't allowed to have an official trial until uh, sunlight. They bound Jesus and led him and handed him over to Pilate. Now, Pilate was the Roman governor at that time. Uh, here's how, how tricky things get. I'm going to talk about this in a little while. But uh, did you know that there's no government Roman records that talk about Governor Pilate? There's nothing. There's no Roman records that talk about government, uh, Governor Pilate. Uh, so I want you to think about that for a little while. Uh, but in the, here in chapter 15, they bound Jesus and hand him over to Pilate. The reason they did that is because they could not execute the death penalty. The, they needed the Romans to give them the death penalty. Pilate said, are you king of the Jews? They asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. And it's funny because Jesus replies like this three different times. Uh, 
why is he being difficult <laughs> right here? And I think it's, it's why is Jesus being difficult right today? And are you king of the Jews? Well, of course he is. More than that, he's king of everyone. Uh, but even here, as he's going to his death, Jesus is not making it easy for history to say he was a p political insurrectionist. He was not making this easy. His kingdom was, was a, a spiritual kingdom, and he didn't want to be confused as being an earthly rebel. Even though scholars today continue to say that, they say it despite the fact that Jesus Christ uh, never said that himself. And uh, even told his followers to put away sword. He said, if I was an earthly rebel, my followers would, would lift up swords, but they didn't. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, are you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison uh, with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. Uh, this is interesting because Mark is written to a Gentile audience, but he's really not explaining. He's saying the uprising as if we'd all know about it. Mark was ver uh, written very early, maybe the first gospel written, uh, and this was before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, so it's sometime very early on, and while he's writing it, everybody knew about that uprising, so he didn't, he didn't uh, explain it to his Gentile readers. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them well, what he usually did, which was to release, he had this tradition of releasing a prisoner at this time uh, in order to have goodwill with the Jewish people. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. So he thought the crowd is definitely going to ask for Jesus. The chief priests are envious of Jesus' popularity. But the chief priests had previously stirred up the crowd to have Pilate uh, release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they shouted. Crucify, crucify. And the word here, crucify, means Stick him with a pole. A hang him on a pole is what they were shouting. What, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. Uh, he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. <clears throat> a couple things. I, I, I remember Japan. Uh, I was a missionary in Japan for eight and a half years when I read this passage. And I always think of uh, Kikuchi-sensei, uh, Japanese pastor who would, at every wedding would go through this section and from the pulpit at the wedding he would thunder uh, crucify crucify <laughs> in, in Japanese and some people thought that wasn't the greatest wedding message but he 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 did because he wanted people to see our sin nature and this is what we did with the Lamb of God uh, and I'm not going to complain about a guy who wants to share the gospel he actually uh, he actually Something popped in his brain or something. He went down while preaching. Uh, the other thing I remember here, and that you guys uh, have heard me tell this story before, but uh, there were some men in Japan, a large group of men who were former Yakuza, and they had tattoos all over their body, and m many of them were missing fingers because I don't remember which finger you're missing, actually, uh, because to get out of the Yakuza uh, free, scot-free without any debt remaining to your Yakuza mafia overlords, you had to give them a finger. So you'd have a ceremony where they'd cut off your finger. So there's all these guys who are now pastors and missionaries and evangelists with tattoos all over their back and missing fingers. And uh, they, uh, they're a neat group. And uh, I remember a uh, couple stories I remember from, from them. I met them on several occasions. One time I was in a train station from far away. I heard somebody yell, Dan, Dan. I looked over and this tough looking guy's coming over to me. And he wanted me to meet his family and his kids, and it was neat. He was part of Barabbas, and he, his kids were mentally handicapped, and he thought that was because of his drug use while he was prior to becoming a Christian, but I don't know. But he was just such a sweet dad, hugging on his kids, and way more affectionate than most uh, Japanese. In fact, the only Japanese person I ever saw as affectionate with that with the kids was a Japanese pastor, and it's just neat to see how the love of Christ gets in, and, and even within the cultural context, it expresses itself like that. Uh, the other neat thing about Barabbas is they actually went and met uh, President Clinton, and they, were, they gave a testimony to him about, look what Christ can do. We're Yakuza. Uh, 
and uh, we're now followers of Jesus Christ. So last week we learned about former headhunters who completely changed when they met Jesus Christ. This week we're meeting hardened criminals, dangerous men, Yakuza, who become teddy bears, sweethearts through the transforming power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Just a beautiful thing. So when I see Barabbas, and the reason they took the name Barabbas, because Jesus took their place. They were set free because Jesus took the punishment. Isn't that a perfect name for a group of former mafioso? That is just so wonderful. Jesus is uh, flogged. When the Romans flogged, they meant business. They'd have pieces of metal. They'd have uh, pieces of glass tied to this whip. Hooks. And when it went into your body, they would often, it's not just a few red lines, it's not just blood, they'd rip up the flesh and the muscle down to the bone. When they flogged, it was serious business. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and it's just neat how this Jewish book uh, has Latin in there now. I mean, this is, this is the situation that was at the time, so they brought into the praetorium and called to, together the whole company of soldiers. And what do these soldiers do? These are hard men. These are scary men. They put a purple robe on him, which was the color for royalty, right? Meredith always likes purple because of that. They put a purple robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns, and they smashed it on his head, set it on him. <coughs> Excuse me. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews, like Hail, Caesar. Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. So they're falling before him like they're worshiping him, like they're honoring him as, as an emperor, as a king. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. So after they whipped him badly, they, they, they beat him and they mocked him. Again, there's nothing like this in pagan mythology. Some nature god dying to bring spring back is not the same as we're seeing right here. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, incidentally, Cyrene was a, a city in northern Africa, Libya, uh, and there was a population when, the, when the Alexander the Great came through, remember he died and his generals were fighting over and uh, the general who took over the region where Jerusalem was, he exiled 100,000 Jews from the region, and they all went to northern Africa, Libya. So Simon of Cyrene, there's several men in Scripture that are from Cyrene, uh, very likely Jews or people who became Jews, uh, could be also because they're Africans, that would be a population of, they were black Jews, remember? We've talked about this before in Ethiopia. And so some speculate that Simon of Cyrene may have been a black Jew as well, uh, living in, in Cyrene. The father of Alexander and Rufus. Now why does the Bible say the father? This is Simon of Cyrene. You know, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Because this is so early written that Simon, probably, Alexander and Rufus were still all alive at that time. That's another clue of when this is written. And they were well known in the church. This is written because early Christians would know Simon of Cyrene, they would know Alexander, and they would know Rufus. In fact, uh, there's mention in other places in Scripture. Uh, the father of Alexander Rufus was passing by uh, on his way from the country. And remember, all the Jews are in, in Jerusalem. They're having this big celebration. Uh, and Ru and si Simon is just passing by, and Jesus is carrying the cross. And because of the severe beating, because of even though he's a carpenter, a big, strong guy probably, uh, because of the severe beating, the whipping, the beatings, uh, Christ can no longer carry his cross. And so this guy, just walking by, they grab him and make him carry Jesus' cross, and he carries it. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing to be Simon. What an amazing thing to be Alexander and Rufus. He carried the cross of Christ. He saw the crucifixion of Christ. And this man... Again, because of the way he's mentioned here and his son's mentioned as well, is very, very, it's almost improbable that he's not a well-known Christian. These are Christians, his family becomes Christian <coughs> because of the blessing of being able to carry the cross of Christ. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, 
which means the place of the skull. And remember, I told you before, Jesus invented, God, creator, invented cute cheeks on babies. God invented cool. And Jesus dies on the place of the skull. Uh, God, uh, you can't make this stuff up. This is what God uh, chose to do. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it, just as the Old Testament uh, prophesied. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes again, as the Old Testament prophesied. They cast lots to see which each would get. It was nine in the morning by this time when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, over his head, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, because remember, nobody doubted his miracles. Everybody knew his miracles. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. They crucified him. Uh, they cru those he cru they crucified with him heaped insults on him, uh, both of the criminals uh, heaping insults, although we know that one of them, uh, while hanging on the cross, is convicted of his sins and becomes a believer. Jesus Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you know what? The people who mock Christ do the same thing today. Well, if he's God, prove himself to me by doing what I want. Jesus was there to die for our sins, and they're saying, well, if he's God, he should come down. If he doesn't come down, it means he's not God. Because they didn't understand what God was doing. And we, people today want to make this little test. Well, if he's God, why is he, he right across the sky, I'm God, worship me? Well, because, I'll tell you what, you'd be a lot of people terrified and fall down. A lot of people would join the throne. A lot of people would probably like the special effects. You still wouldn't have any more people loving him. Jesus Christ is after your heart. <coughs> and you are not in a position to set up a little test as if you know everything on God's heart and mind uh, to declare, God, uh, I'm going to play I'm going to play my fiddle now, and you're going to dance, and if you dance the way I like, then I'll accept you as God. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Had a cold, uh, well, actually about six weeks now. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so, they're mocking Christ. It wasn't enough just to kill him. You notice they never denied the fact that he self saved others. The miracles of salvation, the miracles of forgiveness, the miracles of curing blindness, of curing uh, all sorts of diseases, they, uh, they said he did save others. Let's see if he can save himself. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until 3 in the afternoon. <clears throat> and at 3 in the afternoon, so Christ had been there for what, six hours hanging on the cross? And, and remember, you died on the cross primarily not by having holes in your hands and feet. Uh, you didn't really die that way, but because the way you were hanging, you couldn't take a breath unless you used your hands and feet in agony with the nails there. You had to push yourself up to take a breath. So you would keep pushing yourself up so you could breathe, and eventually you were exhausted and died of exhaustion. And, and some people would even say your heart would actually explode within your chest incredibly horrible, painful way to go. <clears throat> and Jesus has endured this for six hours. But many criminals, many people would survive even longer. And so the Romans were in the habit of coming by and breaking their legs. You wonder why they break their legs. That doesn't kill you either. Well, because then you can no longer push yourself up and then you die of asphyxiation. <clears throat> At noon, darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so then uh, you get Muslims who don't believe Jesus died on the cross say, look at he can't be Jesus because he said, why, God, have you forsaken me? You get atheists saying, well, he can't be God because he's saying God's forsaken him. And you wonder if the early church was just there to convince us that Jesus was God and we should give all our money. One, why they choose a Jew? Why they choose a Jew that was crucified? And why did they record these words of Jesus? My answer is because that's the way it went down. Jesus Christ, his, his human nature, feels at this point, when he says, God, why have you forsaken me? Scholars say this point is when the sin of the world was laid on Jesus. And the first time in history, 
the beauty of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, sin separated Jesus, the Son, from the Holy Spirit and from the Father. He was totally separated. Worse than the physical agony was this separation from God. Now Jesus came so that he could bring us into the, into the fellowship of God. And the same love the Father and Son share, he wants to bring us into this loving relationship. But at this moment, the, the sin of <coughs> every disgusting thing, all the br brutal things that you can't even turn on the news because you can't, you can't stomach it, all the times you've disappointed yourself, disappointed those you love, every time you've said something harsh and mean-spirited to the people you love most, all of this horrible, uh, the, the pain of divorce, the, the, the pain of, of, of self-abuse and, and drug abuse, and all, all the wickedness of, of all the centuries was poured on Christ. <coughs> and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, when some of those uh, standing near heard this, they said, Sounds like he's calling out for Elijah. <coughs> Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to him. So they kind of inside, they, even as they were mocking him, people were waiting to see what happens. Again, even his enemies never denied his power. They attributed his power to the devil. He's casting out demons by the king of the demons, remember? But they knew... This man was different. And so they're sitting back and waiting to see what happens because they don't understand why he actually came, and it was to take their sins upon himself. And he, looking down from the cross, he was even looking at the people who mocked him with love, saying, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Father, please forgive. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed out his last, and elsewhere we see that what he said was actually, it is finished. Another way of translating that is paid in full. It's a debt of sin and he pays it. So there he's on the cross in agony for hours. And his last words are, paid in full. Mission accomplished. I've taken your sin. Brothers and sisters, don't carry that burden anymore. It's been dealt with. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Again, you, if you choose not to believe in Christianity, at least be intellectually honest. There is nothing like this in literature, in history, anywhere else. If ever someone died like a God, it was Jesus. Surely this man was the Son of God, says this eyewitness. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were <coughs> Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and Joseph and Salome in Galilee, these women uh, followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women were also come up to meet him. And then you have Mary, his, his mother. And again, if you're making up a story, at least end up with different names. We don't need so many Marys. But uh, he, there's a lot of Marys there, so that's what Mark records. Uh, it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, so as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, who was part of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, right? But he became a follower of Christ. A prominent member of the council who was, with, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, he had this yearning for the kingdom of God to come, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. Incidentally, the Old Testament prophesied that Jesus would die, but none of his bones would be broken. And so Jesus died before the Romans had to break his bones. Uh, so Joseph uh, brought the linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. So he died among criminals, but he was buried with a rich man, just like the Old Testament said, buried in the tomb of a rich man. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of a tomb. Mary Magdalene married the mother of Joseph, uh, saw where he was laid. Romans 10, 9-13 says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is what Jesus accomplished here. He died for our sins. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is my Lord, I'm not the king of my life anymore. I'm not calling the shots in my life. He's, he's my boss. I know his ways are better than my ways. Well, I've said this before. 
There's a word in the English language, trust. There's a, there's a word in the English language, uh, faith. If you're not going to put your faith in Jesus, the one who loves you and died for you, who are you going to put your faith in? And we'll see next week, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, which if the cross is a neon light flashing history saying he took care of our sins and we're, we're messed up, but he took care of it, then the resurrection is, is this big billboard in history that says God can keep his promises. And he's promised that he will forgive and he will give us eternal life and bring, him into, in, bring us into his family. So you have to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, in which case you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you are, that believe and justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith, and you are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Uh, Stephen and I were talking to a fellow this week about salvation, and I read him this verse. I said, well, a verse similar to this. I said, well, what does that mean? About half the people? 90% of the people? 95% of the people? Well, no. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, everyone means what? 25%? 50%? The really good ones? The ones that polish up nice? No, everyone means everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord Jesus, I'm messed up. I understand, why you had, I understand what the cross is about because I understand I tried. I'm not the man I want to be. I'm not good, Lord. Please forgive. Please help me. Please save me. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. <clears throat> Remember I told you that uh, there's no record of Governor Pilate in any Roman records? I still hear atheists today say, well, you can't trust the written record, you can't trust the Bible, although it was obviously written very early, uh, because uh, we have no independent confirmation of Pilate, of, of Governor Pilate. Well, that's true. In 1961, we did dig up a stone in Jerusalem that was uh, commemorating a building project, and it was dedicated by Prefect Pilate, so I suppose, I suppose that's not good enough for some people. But uh, again and again, what the Bible teaches is confirmed uh, in history. Prefect, uh, there's a prefectus, and there was another term that Pilate is called in history. Uh, Pilate is also mentioned by first century historian, Jewish historian Josephus, and first century Roman historian Tacitus. And when I brought that up to uh, uh, various people I'm talking to, they say, well, probably even though Tacitus was this great historian, he didn't do the research. He just knew Christians were talking about a pilot, so that's why he talked about Pilate. I, I kind of doubt that. But anyways, first century historians, Jewish and Roman, also mention Pilate, uh, Prefect Pilate, both of whom reference also Jesus, uh, Jesus himself and his crucifixion to first century witnesses external to scriptures, not eyewitnesses, but historians. Crucifixion was a terrible way to kill someone. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst criminals, for the worst traitors. Brothers and sisters, Jesus did this for us. How can I, how can we live our lives as a way of saying thank you? What sins do we need to deny? What do we need to make right in our lives? What is, when Christ has bought us with his blood, it means he owns us, Right? everything. Josephus called crucifixion the worst of deaths, and the Roman historian Cicero called it a cruel and disgusting penalty. It's not a cute earring. It's not a cute necklace. And our loving Savior voluntarily endured this, and we said the physical pain was not even as bad as a spiritual anguish when he was separated from the Trinity when the sins of humanity were poured out on him just prior to his death. Jesus did this for you and for I. Before Jesus was hung on a cross, he was whipped, as we said. And here's what the Net Bible had to say about this, going back to the whipping. A Roman flogging, traditionally scourging, was an excruciating punishment, and it's funny they use the word excruciating because excruciating is a term that comes from the word cross. 
The victim was stripped of his clothes and bound to a post with his hands fastened above him, sometimes thrown to the ground. Guards standing on either side of the victim so they could keep their strength going uh, would incessantly beat with a whip a flagellum made out of leather with pieces of lead and bone inserted to the ends. The Jews only allowed 39 lashes, which is more than enough. The Romans had no limit. Many people who received such a beating died during the scourging. The best the world has ever seen was set upon and torn apart by the world he came to save. The dearest and best that the world has ever seen was set apart and torn apart by the world he came to save. The dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. The heart of the gospel is God himself, God incarnate, coming down and suffering, suffering for you and I because we think sin is no big deal. Or we think other people's sins are big deals, but my sin is no big deal. And he came down, he suffered for Dan Wolf. Taking our place, taking the punishment we deserve upon himself. No one so innocent willingly allowed himself to be so mistreated Never has humanity raged with demonic fury against one who loved them so much. Are we loving God with our lives today? When the curtain was torn in two, what, what time was that? Three o'clock, three o'clock yep. When the curtain was torn in two, it was 3 p.m., that was the time of the evening sacrifice in the temple. Jesus giving himself at the time of the evening sacrifice. There were many priests who would be gathered in the temple at that time. And imagine the anguish, how distraught they were, the fear, when the veil to the Holy, Holy, Holy of Holies was rent asunder. You see, you'd have this huge curtain. The Bible says the curtain was torn in two. We read over that. What does that mean? They would have at the Jewish temple a place that was so holy that only the high priest could go there once a year. And this huge curtain hanging in this giant temple was ripped in two pieces when Christ died here. At the time of the sacrifice, Christ died. The curtain was about 60 feet high. By the way, that was bigger than Solomon's temple, which would have been one of the wonders of the world if it had stood. But Herod, uh, this great builder, has built some of the greatest buildings in the history of the Roman Empire. Uh, he built the curtain 60 foot high, 30 foot wide, and they said a, hand, a hand's length wide, about four inches wide. This was not a sheet that was torn. This was a massive, massive curtain. It was so big and heavy that Josephus said uh, two strong horses, uh, one on, horse on each side could not open the curtain. It was so huge. They could not rip it or pull it apart. This miracle, maybe, because I said the temple was full of uh, priests, one of the reasons why so many priests came to faith in Christ. And you're thinking, what? Priests came to faith in Christ? Jewish priests? Listen to this from Acts 6-7. And the word of God increased, and the, number, and the number of disciples multiplied Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests became obedient to the faith. These priests, many of them probably in the temple when the curtain, and they all heard, wow, Christ was crucified at this moment. He died at this moment. The temple veil was torn in two. Now, and what does the temple veil torn in two mean? Now you and I, everybody, we have access into the Holy of Holies. We go directly to God in prayer. We don't have a priest standing in front of us. That was important to teach us God is holy. He's set apart. Now through the blood of Jesus Christ, he said, I've done away with that. The separation has been torn away, and everybody... Uh, can come into God's uh, presence. There's no priesthood. There's no pastor who stands between us and God. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Uh, the Bible's telling us Jesus Christ opened a way for us to go directly into God's presence. And then 2 Corinthians from chapter 5 for Christ's love compels us. We're compelled by the love of Christ because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore we are included in his death. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him. Did you hear that? He died for all of us that those who are still breathing 
We should no longer live for ourselves. I got to do what's right for number one, look out for myself. But that we should live our lives for him who died for us and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Well, that can't stand those people, can't stand that guy. We regard nobody from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, before he became a Christian, Paul's talking about, we no longer do, would do so. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. Behold, the new is here. If you are in Christ, it's a brand new life, new priorities, new values, new purpose, everything brand new. All this is from God, who reconciled, made this reconciliation, this peace, reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So what's the ministry of reconciliation? Well, we're bringing peace. We're, we're bringing people the love and grace of God. And we're trying to teach people to, to have this peace with God, show them the grace of God, and then how we can love one another as well. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Do you have sins you don't want God to count against you? Accept what Christ did for you on the cross. Don't imagine your own goodness. Don't try to do it on your own. You can't. Take the grace. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. God pleading through us, get right with God. God pleading through us like we're ambassadors to this, to this, to this world of sin, sadness, death, tears. And we're reaching out, pleading, God himself pleading through us. Get right with God. There's salvation here. The cross, Jesus Christ took care of all your sins. You don't need to carry that burden on you anymore. We implore you. So now we have this appealing and now we have this imploring. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Lord God, we thank you for this witness. Uh, we thank you f that uh, you saw fit to have this book uh, placed in the scriptures, Lord. We thank you, Lord, <coughs> that you loved us so much you came and died for our sins. Lord, there's nobody like you. There's nobody else in, in the history of literature, the history of mythology like you, Lord. Uh, this kind of love, this kind of goodness coming to set us free, Lord God. Uh, if there's not hope in this, there's no hope anywhere, Lord, certainly not in ourselves, uh, certainly not in our culture, Lord. Father, Lord, King, we come to you. We offer our lives to you. Thank you that you incarnated yourself and died for us and rose again. So we knew, know that you love us, that you're not counting our sins against us, and that we know that you can keep your promises. So, Lord, we want to confess eagerly, we're your people. We belong to you. We're not going to struggle. We're not going to fight. We're Christians bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, in our hearts, we believe that you are good, that you are quick to forgive, that you are eager to forgive, that you are imploring us to come to you so that you can forgive us. Father, we believe in you, and we want to live our lives testifying to who you are and to your goodness. In the love you've poured out onto us, Lord, help us to love other people enough to tell them about the cross, about the way they can be reconciled and find forgiveness and made right with you. God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for loving us just as we are. Thank you for not loving us so much you don't want to leave us just as we are, but you have a plan for us, Lord. And you've given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ and one day you will perfect, you'll finish the work you've begun in us, Lord, and we will stand before you, Lord, uh, in holiness. And we thank you for that, Father. Thank you for this church. Thank you for all the sisters and brothers here today. Uh, God, uh, please bless us. Please bless us even in ways that we're not thinking about in unexpected ways today, Lord. I pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose again. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. 
Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just... Uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area, and I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to 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 know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Hi, this is John with Foundation TV. You know, Foundation Church is a small church uh, here in Janesville. We do a lot with the size of the congregation that we have. Uh, and we've been really pleased to host Foundation TV for many years. Uh, however, due to budget constraints, we're no longer able to do that at this time. Uh, if you would like to find Foundation TV, we're still available on YouTube. Uh, at the address below and on local access channels 98 and in HD 994. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.